In the first section of the Theology of the Body, Pope John Paul II starts with the question that was asked by the Pharisees to Jesus about whether divorce was allowable. And Jesus' response took all of us back to the beginning. In St. Matthew's Gospel, we read that in the beginning it was not so that the human heart had led to divorce, but God in the beginning made man and woman to leave father and mother and cling to each other, to become one flesh with each other, and that what God has joined, man must not divide. That was the launching pad for the Holy Father to discuss the theology of the body most properly speaking, what Christ revealed about the human person in his beginning. When Pope John Paul II looked there, he saw a few aspects of man's origin. First, that man was created alone. Even though he had, God had created all the creation for him, even though God was in relationship with him, man experienced an original solitude. That he was different from all of the creatures that God had allowed him to name, and he was also different from God who had created him. And after God had said, after the first six days of creation, it was good, it was good, it was good. Finally, after the creation of man, it was very good. Finally, God said, it is not good. Precisely, it is not good for man to be alone. I will make a fitting helper for him. And so God created Eve out of Adam's side. And that original solitude led to the original unity, that they were called to give of themselves to each other in a communion of persons in love. And that's why their bodies were made to be able to show to each other and bring about more fully this communion of persons through their bodies. That communion of persons in love was shown in a particular way by their originally innocent glances toward each other. They, as sacred scripture tells us, looked on each other and were unashamed. And that lack of shame in the beginning pointed to their original innocence, to the purity of heart. When they looked at each other, Eve looked at Adam and saw two things. First, she saw somebody whose whole nature spoke a gift, a gift of himself to her. And in looking at him too, Eve saw a summons for her to give her of herself over to Adam in love. Adam, looking at Eve, saw exactly the same thing, both this gift and this summons for him to give of himself, this mutual giving and acceptance of the other person in an act of love. That will all be shattered in the fall, which leads to the second section of the theology of the body. Christ himself, in his Sermon on the Mount, took the experience of original sin and made it very concrete in man's heart which had become hardened. And he said, any man who looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Christ took morality out from just external actions to the real source of morality, the human heart, what the human being thinks and feels in experience with another human person. And so in the original experience of the threefold lust that St. John describes in his first reading, in his first letter that Pope John Paul II developed, Christ shows how man's heart had become hardened and then takes it back to the original sin which led to it. Original sin was basically a distrust of each other. We see it in an, encapsulated in an expression that they hid themselves out of fear because they were naked. They covered themselves, especially their sexual parts, Adam and Eve, from each other because they lost the original trust they had in that nuptial spousal meaning of their body for each other to be a gift in love. And then they also hid themselves from God because they no longer trusted in the goodness of creation, in the goodness of God's love for them. Original sin shattered that trust. It shattered the communion of persons between Adam and Eve, and it shattered the communion of persons that is meant to exist between the human person and God who is a communion of persons. That leads to the third of the seven sections of the theology of the body that the Holy Father describes, which is life in the spirit. Man needs to be able to recover in Christ's redemptive love what it means to be a person, what it means to be a real lover. But he recognizes that man cannot do it on his own. 
So Pope John Paul II takes a section of St. Paul's letter to the Romans in which St. Paul makes a huge contrast between life according to the Spirit, meaning the Holy Spirit, and life according to the flesh, and says that we're called with the help of the Holy Spirit, with God's grace given us through the redemption of Jesus on the cross to restore those original values so that we can truly love each other as God loves us, so that we can be ministers of that love to each other, so that there can be a real communion of persons between Adam and Eve. Part of that means living as a temple of the Holy Spirit, holding the body in holiness and honor, avoiding all types of unchastity, and glorifying God in the body. All other passages from St. Paul's writings that the Holy Father will use to elucidate this call of the human person to live according to the Spirit in a genuine communion of persons in love. That leads to the fourth section of the theology of the body, which has to do with man's destiny, the end of time. The human body will be raised from the dead at the end of time by Christ. So the human body is meant to experience fully heaven, just like the human soul experiences heaven. And in that, we see the fulfillment of this nuptial, spousal, self-giving aspect of the human body and the human person. Because the body, which is meant for communion of persons in love in this life, is meant to achieve its fulfillment in the communion of persons in heaven through the body. What does that mean? God is a communion of persons in love, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And heaven, most precisely, is our entrance into that communion of persons in love, body and soul, just like Jesus has entered that communion, body and soul. But when we enter into that communion of persons with God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that is the basis for the communion of saints in heaven when we exist in communion with them. That whole understanding leads to the fifth section of the theology, the body, which is the other way of living the nuptial meaning of the body and the human person here in this world, which in, is in consecrated virginity or celibacy. That because of the eternal destiny of the human person and the person's body and soul, in this world, people can, for the sake of the kingdom of heaven, responding to God's divine gift, give of themselves wholly and entirely over to God and anticipate heaven, thereby also giving a sign to everybody else of what the eternal destiny of the human body is, to be given over to God in love, to be given in exchange in a chaste way in the communion of persons who is the communion of saints. That leads to the sixth section, which is how Christ reveals man to himself and his eternal destiny in the gift of self in marriage here in this world. Christ is the full meaning of who it means to be a human person. And in his marriage with the church, which St. Paul describes in the fifth chapter of St. Paul's letter to the Ephesians, in that marriage, we learn how human spouses are supposed to relate to each other in self-giving love. That is the basis that the Holy Father uses to take all of those first six section, sections and apply it to the burning issue in every age of the use of artificial contraception in marriage. When we look at the human person as God has revealed the human person, what do we see? We see that nuptial meaning. We see that call to full communion of persons through the body, this full acceptance of who God made that other person to be. And in artificial contraception, the Holy Father says, that nuptial meaning is rejected because the man's paternal meaning to his body or the woman's maternal meaning to her body is rejected in the very act made for it by God, this union of two persons in one flesh. That's where we're going to be heading over the course of the next seven talks in which we'll get into each of these areas very concretely. But in sum, Pope John Paul II follows the method of Jesus himself, who, in describing what marriage is supposed to be, first takes marriage back to the beginning, before the fall with Adam and Eve, then describes man who he is right now, with the need to repair his heart and give him a new heart, and then to the end, to heaven, to the fulfillment of the human person. We're going to follow Christ and his vicar on that journey over this time. We're in for quite a ride. See you next episode.